All right, so <clears throat> in the last video, we introduced the notion of convergence of a sequence, right? So this is just whether or not um, the limit of a sequence exists and gives a finite value as n goes to infinity, right? So um, if you calculate the limit and the limit is either infinite or the limit doesn't exist, then we would say the sequence diverges. Um, if it, uh, so a convergence sequence is going to be one where we actually get a number for the limit. So that's what we're looking for here, okay? Um, now, one of the things that is worth pointing out is that if your sequence um, if your sequence is, you know, given by f of n, um, where we know how to do this limit, the limit as x goes to infinity. So if we replace n with a real variable, x, and we calculate that limit and it exists, well, then the limit as n goes to infinity of a n will agree, right? Now, that doesn't always work because there will be situations where this limit doesn't exist, but we can still make sense of the, of the sequence because there might be functions that, you know, for a real variable, they're jumping around all over the place, but you put in only integer values and things settle down. Uh, but this does give a handy tool, especially for something like this, because we know how to do a limit like this, right? Um, we know that if we were doing the limit as n goes to infinity, of 3n squared minus 2n plus 1 over, over n squared minus 1,000, right? Um, if we had x instead of n here, then this is a problem that you did way back in the very first chapter on limits, right? Very beginning of Calc 1. Um, we'd say, okay, it's quadratic top and bottom, right? If the degree is the same on top and bottom, we look at the ratio of the coefficients, 3 over 1. Um, we know that limit is 3, so it converges. It converges to 3. So that's, that's simple enough, right? It's, it's good enough to do that. I mean, you should say something, right? Say, why is it 3? Well, because it's the same degree top and bottom, and that's a rule that we learn, right? Um, if you feel like that's too easy and you want to show a little bit of work, well, you could always do that same trick that we did with the real variable, divide everything by n squared, right? Um, so you could write this as the limit n going to infinity of 3 minus 2 over n plus 1 over n squared, 1 minus 1,000 over n squared. Um, and you can use the limit definition, you can give an epsilon n proof to show that the limit of anything, any constant over n, that limit is going to be zero. Same with n squared, n cubed, you know, constant over any um, positive power of n is going to go to zero. So we get three over one in the limit, we get three. Great. You move on to something like this. Well, this, if you plot it, it's an interesting thing because if you plot this function, if you plot the sequence, right, I mean, we know what it is a function of x, so you get this cosine wave, it oscillates back and forth. Um, but if you start plotting the points for this sequence, um, the textbook has this scatter plot, shows you what it looks like. Well, then it's a little bit different, right, because um, you're only plugging in the integer values. So you're, I mean, you're getting points that are on that cosine wave, right, but only, only at the integer values. And and the cosine wave, you know, if we're just doing cos n, it's not oscillating with an integer period, right? The period is a multiple of pi. Um, so things are going to actually jump around a whole lot. It's going to be kind of funny looking. Um, but nonetheless, we know for sure that this is not going to exist, right? Um, so this limit diverges. So this sequence diverges. I mean, we need to give a reason for it. But one of the things we know is that well, we know the limit as x goes to infinity of cos x. That doesn't exist, right, because it oscillates back and forth between minus 1 and 1, right? We hit those values infinitely many times. Now, we're not actually going to hit minus 1 or 1 for this because we're not actually going to get to, you know, a multiple of pi over, uh, to a multiple of pi, right? Um, we don't get to a multiple of pi. 
Um, but we get close, right? Um, so somewhere along the way, you know, n's going to infinity, we have all the integers in there. So somewhere along the way, we have, we have you know, 3, all right? We have 31, 314, right? 3,141. You know, uh, um, we have 3,100 or 31,415, you know, um, we, we have these numbers which are very close to, to multiples of pi, right? We can kind of add more digits of pi, but before the decimal, right? So this is, this is close to 100 pi, 1,000 pi, 10,000 pi, right? Those are all even multiples of pi. And then we could also consider, you know, odd multiples. We can shift things a bit. Um, so we can get lots of values that are close to 1. We can also generate values that are close to minus 1. We can get all kinds of things in between, right? Um, so it's never going to get close to any value. It's going to keep jumping back and forth forever. Um, so that's no good. Okay. Now, uh, you come to this last one, and there are a couple of ways that you can tackle something like that. Um, one would be to, to go to the, to the definition. Or, I mean, you want to probably play around a little bit, right? And you say, okay, well, the terms in the sequence are going to be, right, I'm going to have like minus one, then I'm going to have a half, then minus a third, plus a quarter, minus a fifth, plus, plus one sixth, right? And so if you start plotting them, you can kind of see that, yeah, it looks like they're going to zero because you have, well, one way to think about it is that you have, if we draw in, here's y is one over x, and down here we can put in y is minus one over x, right? And, and so the, the terms in the sequence are going to be, you know, I guess the first one would be down here, and then up here, and then here, and then there, and then there, and then there, right? Um, so you can see that they're getting closer and closer to zero. Um, the trouble is we can't actually, we can't write this as a function of x as it is. Minus one to the x makes no sense. At least if we're working with real numbers, it makes no sense. Um, now, one of the things you can do is something that we observed initially. Um, here is a function that actually agrees with this sequence on the integers. Cos pi x over x, right? Because multiples of pi, right, integer multiples of pi, when you plug them into cosine, you get either 1 or minus 1, like we were just talking about. Uh, so there's a function of x that agrees with our sequence at every integer, and if you take the limit of that, well, we, we saw that, again, but go back to calc 1 methods. Um, squeeze theorem essentially is going to tell you, right, because the absolute value of this f of x, right, well, absolute value of cosine is less than or equal to 1. So this is less than or equal to 1 over x in absolute value. And so the function is sandwiched in between minus 1 over x on the one hand and plus 1 over x on the other hand. We know that those both go to 0, so this has to go to 0 as well. Actually, that squeeze theorem argument, you can use that for, for sequences as well. That's perfectly valid, right? We can just say, well, look, it's true that minus 1 over n is less than or equal to cn, less than or equal to 1 over n for all, for all n. And we know that that goes to 0. We know that that goes to 0. Squeeze theorem says that this has to go to 0 as well. So we know that the limit as n goes to infinity of cn is 0. So it converges, and it converges to 0.